think we can we can get started. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Penn State uh, CPSI third uh, seminar series. Um, my name is Jay Zhu. Uh, this uh, seminar series is uh, co-hosted by me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Lan Kong. Uh, we are both faculty members at the uh, Department of uh, Public Health Sciences at Penn State. Uh, first, let me um, uh, go through some basic logistics uh, for this uh, Zoom uh, webinar. Uh, this Zoom session is being recorded automatically. Um, all the attendees are muted except for the panelists. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, submit questions anytime uh, using the Q&A box. And uh, if you register for this seminar, you will actually receive the email afterwards uh, that contains the slides and the recording link, and also a seminar feedback survey. Um, and we do encourage you to uh, register for the uh, future seminars. You can go to our website, ctsi.psu.edu. Then you can go to research support and the seminars. You will see the future seminars. All right. Uh, today, uh, we are very uh, excited to have our beloved former department chair, uh, Dr. Vern Cincilli here. Uh, Dr. Cincilli is the university distinguished professor at Penn State. He received his PhD in statistics from UNC Chapel Hill in 1979 and joined Penn State as a professor in uh, 1992. Dr. Chinchili has served as the uh, department chair at the Department of Public Health Sciences for many years. He decided to step down from the chair position earlier this year so he can have more time to devote to his uh, teaching and research. Dr. Chinchili has served as the uh, principal investigator for multiple data coordinating centers of various national research networks sponsored by the NIH, primarily in uh, lung diseases and kidney diseases. He has made uh, significant contributions to biostatistics to biostatistical methodology for the analysis of biomedical research data from multi-center clinical trials. The uh, topics of Dr. Chinchili's lecture today is design of cluster randomized trials. Welcome, Vern. Uh, I will uh, let you uh, get started from here. So let me uh, stop sharing my screen and then you can, you can get started. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jay, for the introduction. So as you heard, the topic today is cluster randomized trials. So in most randomized clinical trials, I'm sure you're aware that individuals are randomized to the control and intervention groups. In cluster randomized trials, as the name suggests, clusters of individuals or groups of individuals are randomized to the control and intervention groups. So examples of clusters are hospitals, clinics, uh, schools, factories, geographic regions, etc. So the first key feature of a cluster randomized trial is that the individuals within a cluster are correlated, unlike what we have with the individually randomized trial, where we assume individuals are independent of each other. With a cluster randomized trial, there tends to be a small level of correlation uh, within each cluster. And so we need to account for that. Um, the second key feature is that the sample sizes of the clusters tend to be large. 
So the trial may consist of only a small number of clusters. That's not ideal, as I'll describe later. So there's three main reasons for invoking a cluster randomized design for a clinical trial. First, the intervention uh, has to be applied to an entire cluster, or it's just more convenient to do it in that manner. Um, the second issue is, the second reason is that there could be a contamination of the interventions within a cluster if study participates are randomized individually to interventions within a cluster. Now, what I mean by that is if you're individually randomized people within say a medical center or a clinic um, and some people get control, some get the uh, new intervention, they may talk to each other, especially if the intervention is of a behavioral or um, uh, is behavioral or educational nature. They may talk to each other, share materials. And so that's what I mean by contamination of individuals who are randomized to control an intervention. So many times we resort to a cluster randomized design for the very reason of trying to avoid this contamination. <clears throat> and the third reason to consider a cluster randomized trial is the study objective is to estimate population level effects of an intervention administered to a large portion of the population. So just to give you an example, uh, I have the references at the very end in case you wanna investigate any of these references, but Hayes and Moulton actually wrote an entire book on cluster randomized trials. And one of their examples is called the post trial. There were 52 medical practices randomized to intervention and control, 25 and 27 respectively. And the medical practices recruited a total of 328 patients with coronary heart disease. Um, each study participant had been hospitalized due to myocardial infarction or unstable angina. The participants assigned to the intervention received mailings two weeks and three months after hospital discharge. And these mailings describe methods to reduce the risk of future cardiovascular events. The participants assigned to the control did not receive any mailings after they were discharged from the hospital. So in this post trial, the investigators randomized the medical practices to intervention and control instead of randomizing the individual study participants. And primarily their reason for that was they were concerned about contamination. In other words, the study participants within a medical practice would discuss or share their materials with each other. So as I mentioned uh, in a previous slide, individuals within a cluster tend to be correlated with each other. The correlation usually is positive and small, whereas a negative correlation is rare. So statistical analyses need to account for this correlation and are not comprised of your standard t-tests or standard chi-square tests. So the statistical analyses for the cluster um, randomized trial are a little bit more complex than you might be accustomed to. Okay, um, in another example, uh, taken from the Hayes and Moulton book again, they showed some hypothetical data of two different cluster randomized trial. We'll call them trial A and trial B. Each trial consisted of 10 villages with five villages randomized to control, meaning they got no health education and five villages randomized to the intervention where health education was provided. And the outcome variable was measured on each child enrolled in the study um, was the presence or absence of diarrhea. So if you look at this table, this shows these hypothetical results. If you look at trial A, 
remember there's five villages, randomized to control, five to intervention within each of the two trials. You'll notice if you look at the very bottom of the slide, the overall um, percentage of diarrhea was 10% in the control and 6% in intervention. You'll notice that the same thing overall resulted in trial B with 10% and 6% as the overall percentages of diarrhea. Right? But if you examine the entries within the table a little bit more carefully, you'll notice that in trial A, the percentages within a village are um, closely uh, related to each other. If you look at the control villages, you see in trial A, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12%. In the intervention villages, you see 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8%. Whereas if you shift over to trial B, you'll notice that the, there's more spread in the percentages across the villages. For control, you have 4, 7, 10, 13, and 16%. Intervention, you have 0, 3, 6, 9, and 12%, right? So just eyeballing this, your intuition should tell you that the evidence in trial A is much stronger than the evidence in trial B. In fact, the p-values from doing the appropriate analyses indicate that the um, trial A had a significant difference between control and intervention where the p-value was 0.02, and trial B did not display a significant result where the p-value is 0.20. If you just use the data at the very bottom, just comparing the raw percentages, you get that both trials, the p-value was 0.03. And so you would conclude, yeah, there was a significant effect in both trials. But if you do an appropriate analysis, to account for the clustering of the villages, you get very different results. So that's illustrated here in this graph. As you can see, um, the first two columns in the graph represent control and intervention in trial A, and the latter two columns represent control and intervention in trial B. And that illustrates the results that we saw in the table. And you can see why trial A led to a statistically significant result, but trial B did not. Okay, so let's get into some of the modeling involved. I'll try not to get too detailed about this, but we need to describe this so that you get some, you get some semblance of understanding as to what happens here. So we're going to let y sub ij denote the outcome variable measured on the jth participant within the ith cluster. So we'll assume that there are capital C clusters, and j is going to range from 1 to m sub i. So yes, there could be a number of different, the cluster side, the number of individuals within a cluster can vary from one cluster to another. We have two sources of variability in a cluster randomized trial. We have the variance that's due to um, transitioning from one cluster to another. So we would call that the between cluster or inter cluster variance. And then we have the intra cluster variance, what happens within a cluster from one individual to another within a cluster. So we call that within cluster or intra cluster variance. And the notation I'll use is sigma b squared and sigma w squared respectively for between cluster and within cluster variances. Then the total variance on the jth participant within the i cluster is going to be the sum of these two variances, sigma b squared plus sigma w squared. The intra-cluster covariance is defined as the covariance between any two individuals within the same cluster. And using this statistical model, it's 
straightforward to show that this covariance is sigma b squared. Then what we're really going to focus on is the intracluster correlation, the ICC. This represents the correlation between any two individuals within a cluster. So we're just transforming from the covariance to the correlation. And that turns out to be sigma b squared divided by sigma b squared plus sigma w squared. Right. So you can see. This is going to be a positive value based on this type of modeling approach, simply because variances are positive, and also that it's going to be less than one. So our ICC will range between zero and one. Okay. So in general, cluster randomization yields less precision, meaning more variability in estimating model parameters. What I mean by the model parameters are the intervention mean and the control mean. The increase in the variance due to the cluster randomization is called the design effect and is described as the ratio of the variance based on cluster randomization to the variance based on had you performed individual randomization. So because the sample size for a planned trial with a continuous outcome is the re directly related to the variance, the sample size for a trial based on a cluster randomization can be determined as the design effect times the sample size for a trial based on individual randomization. So for example, if the design effect, if you determine that the design effect is 1.5, and the sample size for a trial based on individual randomization is 120, then the sample size you would need for a comparable trial based on cluster randomization is 180. Right. So let's dig into this a little bit more. If we assume that the cluster sample sizes are all equal, in other words, M1 equals M2 equals all the way up to MC. I'll call that M as the common cluster sample size. Then you can show statistically, we're not going to derive it here, but the design effect is one plus M minus one times the intracluster correlation coefficient. Right? Now, typically, this ICC, this intracluster correlation coefficient ranges, it's small. It doesn't tend to be large. It can range, most examples I've seen, it ranges between zero and 0.2. So even in that situation, if M is relatively large, the design effect will be large. So for example, if the intracluster correlation coefficient is 0.05, which is reasonable. And if you plan to have 50 individuals recruited within each cluster, then using that formula for the design effect, you get a value of 3.45. So if you were, if you had performed individual randomization and did a sample size calculation and discovered you needed 100 participants for the cluster randomized trial, with 50 individuals per cluster, you would need 345 participants. And this was under a reasonably small assumption for the intracluster correlation coefficient of 0.05. So in a cluster randomized trial, it actually is better from a sample size perspective to have more clusters with a small number of participants per cluster rather than having fewer clusters with a large number of participants per cluster. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. A lot of times you have a cluster randomized trial where maybe there's eight or 10 clusters and a large number of individuals within a cluster. And so you can see that in such a situation, the design effect could be very large. 
Uh, if the outcome variable is binary, whereas on the previous slide, I assumed it was continuous, um, then we do not have an explicit expression for sigma w squared, the within uh, cluster variance or intra cluster variance. One approach that's been proposed by statisticians is to substitute the value of pi squared over three for sigma w squared. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics of this, but basically this involves assuming that you have a latent or unobserved variable y star that's continuous and follows a standard logistic distribution, and then construct a binary random variable y from y star. So that's all at a theoretical level, because as I said, y star isn't observed. But anyway, with this approach, mathematically, you end up getting an expression for sigma w squared that's pi squared over three. So then you can get an expression for the intracluster correlation coefficient, assuming you have some preliminary data or some reference in the literature to give you an estimate of sigma b squared. Now, I'm sure some of you are from, who do clinical trials are familiar with the consort statement. The consort statement provides standards for how you report the results of the typical two-armed, individually randomized parallel clinical trial, right? There have been a number of other consort statements for different types of clinical trials. And it turns out that there is a consort statement for a cluster randomized trial. Right? So if you uh, examine the article, um, you will see that table one in the article provides a checklist for the items you should report when you're writing a manuscript and planning to submit it to a journal in which you're reporting the results of a cluster randomized trial. So some of the unique features of this consort statement compared to the standard consort are as follows. Um, you should mention in your title of your manuscript that it's a cluster randomized trial. Um, the introduction, you should describe a rationale, provide a rationale for why you're using a cluster design. Also in the introduction, whether objectives pertain to the cluster level or the individual participant level or both. Uh, in trial design, you should define cluster and the, the definition of the cluster and describe how the design features were applied to the clusters. Participants, what are the eligibility for the clusters? The interventions, whether the interventions pertain to the cluster level or the individual participant level or both. And then the outcomes, whether the outcome measures pertain to the cluster level, the individual participant level or both. There's a lot more about how you do the sample size calculation, how you performed randomization, whether you stratified or did some matching of the clusters. Um, also how you performed, how you generated the random allocation, who enrolled the clusters, who assigned clusters to interventions. So a lot of detailed information about your, how the cluster randomized trial was designed. And then, of course, you get eventually you notice all the categories about randomization. Then how you accounted for this in your statistical methods. And then the reporting of results. Okay. So I think you've heard enough of that. Um, and then they provided a box. in which they try to give another synopsis on the design, the conduct, the analysis, and the interpretation. So I'm not going to go through this, but I just wanted you to be aware that this consort statement is very valuable when you're trying to write a manuscript 
based on a cluster randomized trial. So here's another example uh, taken from the Hayes and Moulton book. So this was a cluster randomized trial that was performed in Northern Ghana. The researchers partitioned the area of study into 96 geographic regions of interest. So these are the clusters. They randomized 48 of them to control and 40, the other 48 to intervention. The intervention consisted of bed nets. So the primary outcome variable was child mortality measured as time until death during a two year follow-up period. The concept here is that the bed net will prevent um, insect bites while the child is sleeping, leading to a lower mortality rate for the intervention. They had some covariates they wanted to account for in their statistical analysis that included female status and age in months at the study entry for the child. So the researchers performed a proportional hazard regression with a random effect for cluster. Um, and this indicated a statistically significant reduction in the hazard ratio due to the intervention the estimated hazard ratio for mortality was 0.84, and its 95% confidence interval ranged from 0.73 to 0.99. So you can see that the confidence interval doesn't contain 1.0. So the researchers concluded that bed netting was significantly effective in reducing mortality across these 98 regions in Ghana. Another example taken from Hayes and Moulton, this was a cluster randomized trial performed in Scotland. Um, the researchers randomly assigned 25 schools to control or intervention. The intervention here consisted of sexual health education. And the primary outcome was a knowledge score that ranged from minus eight to plus eight. And the covariates that the researchers wanted to include in their analysis were sex and the parents' social class. And there were six levels uh, that they used for uh, categorizing social class. The researchers applied a linear mixed effects model, which indicated a statistically significant increase in knowledge score for the intervention schools. Um, the estimate of the between or inter-cluster variance was 0.12. The estimate of the within or intra-cluster variance was 5.06. And thus the estimate of the intra-class, intra-cluster correlation coefficient is 0.02. So let's talk about this now in terms of sample size calculation. So this is hypothetical, I generated this up. So the investigator wants to determine the sample size for comparing two asthma therapies with respect to the forced expiratory volume in one second, a lung function measurement. The investigator wants a two-sided 0.05 significance level test with 90% statistical power. Uh, the effect size that the investigator hopes to detect is delta of 0.25 liters. And the standard deviation reported in the literature for a similar population is 0.75 liters. Um, the investigator wants equal allocation to the two treatment groups. And if you assume individual randomization, the sample size calculation leads to three, a total of 382 individuals, which is 191 per group. And that's not accounting for dropouts. If you anticipate dropouts in your study, you'd have to inflate that 
number of 382 to account for dropouts. But suppose the investigator decided to pursue a cluster randomized trial and that he expected about 30 participants per clinical center. So the clinical centers will serve as the clusters. If the interclass correlation coefficient or intercluster correlation coefficient is 0 0.025, then our design effect using that previous formula would be one plus 30 minus one, which is 29 times 0 0.025, which is 1.725. So let's take our design effect of 1.725 times the sample size that had been calculated based on individual randomization, which was 382. This yields that the total sample size should be 659 or in that range. So how many clusters, how many clinical centers does the investigator need where assuming each clinical center would recruit 30 individuals? Well, that's approximately 22, well, it's 22 clusters. Um, 30 times 22 would be 660. Okay. So that brings us to the next variation on the theme called the stepped wedged cluster randomized trial. Right? So a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial, as I said, is a variation in that each cluster starts out on the control intervention, but eventually uh, transitions to the new intervention. And what the randomization process determines is at what point in time does, should each cluster initiate this transition to the new intervention. Okay. So this is in contrast to what I described previously with the standard cluster randomized trial in which the cluster is randomized to control or intervention when you begin the study and the cluster maintains that intervention throughout the course of the study. So in essence, where we get the term stepped wedge is because the design mimics this figure here. So suppose, for example, we were planning a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial with 12 clusters and that there were going to be six implementation phases. So you can see in phase zero, everybody is on each of the 12 clusters uh, is on the control, right? That's phase zero. So yellow represents control, blue represents the new intervention. When it's time for phase one, you've randomized two of the clusters to start receiving the new intervention while the remaining 10 clusters stay on with the control. When that phase is finished, you're going to randomize two more clusters in phase two to start on the new intervention and so on. So this type of a figure gives the appearance of a stepped wedge, which is where the term came from. Right? Now, why would you want to do something like this? Right? Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, the obvious advantage of the stepped wedge cluster randomized design is that every cluster eventually uh, transitions to the new intervention, which could increase the willingness of clusters or your clinical centers, whatever they are, that their willingness, it would increase their willingness to participate in the trial. Right. Um, one article, Hemming and colleagues, they say there could be a statistical advantage as well that the stepped wedge design could yield higher statistical power, especially if the intracluster correlation is larger than 0.1. And actually, I think it, even when it's greater than 0.05, I think it can do some, yield a higher statistical power, right? One issue though, if you look at the first bullet point here on this slide, one issue is that the there are some logistical issues is that 
what should the researchers do with individuals who get recruited who straddle the control intervention and the new intervention periods? Should they remain on the control intervention when they start it, or should they cross over to the new intervention? So that's an issue that the researchers have to determine uh, when they're developing the protocol for their stepped wedge design. Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, in a hype, again, this is hypothetical. A group of investigators conducted a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial. They recruited eight sites and planned for a baseline period along with the eight active periods. So in each of the eight phases, one cluster would transition to the intervention. All eight clusters used a control intervention during the baseline period and were randomized to the period in which they initiated the intervention. Uh, the outcome variable was continuous and normally distributed. The estimated control mean was 4.9. The estimated intervention mean was 5.5. And they were significantly different. The p-value was less than 0 0.001. And in this hypothetical data set that I created, the estimated um, intracluster correlation was 0 0.08. Now, guess what? There's also a consort statement for stepped wedge cluster randomized trials. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's a table here as well in this consort statement that talks about key issues that you need to address for the stepped wedge cluster randomized trial. Right? And there's a checklist as well. That appears in table three of the article. Right? Now, all is not rosy. Um, Cotts and colleagues published two articles about 10 years ago in which they recommend investigators should not invoke stepped wedge cluster randomized trial design. A lot of their arguments focus on they said where they said, well, it's added complexity and you don't really need it. You could do just as well with your standard cluster of a randomized trial. But in reality, that seems like their major concern is that it imposes the stepped wedge design could impose a heavier burden on the participants, researchers, and involved institutions simply because of the duration of the stepped wedge study design. Okay, so actually that is all I had to present today. So we do have a good deal of time remaining to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Warren. Uh, let me see if there's some one. One was just a thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just a saying hello to you. Yeah. To our audience, if you have any question, uh, please just post on the FQ&A board. But there's another question mark. So one of the, um, the first question is why have they become so prominent in the last few years despite their increased burden? Well, I think the main reason is the fact that it's appealing to the um, clusters themselves, the medical centers, the clinics, the schools, whatever, because eventually everyone is going to get the intervention. So researchers like that concept. It makes recruiting 
clinics and med centers easier for them because they can promise that, yes, eventually you're going to get the intervention. You're not going to be randomized to a control and stay on that control. So I think that's why they become more popular. But obviously, they are more complex. There's more logistics to deal with. Um, the length of time that they stay on, um, that they in, are involved in the study uh, is an issue, as I indicated. You could do some modification. It could be that if somebody, if a clinic or a cluster is randomized, say, um, in phase one to the intervention, maybe you don't need to follow them all the way out to the end. Maybe you can stop after phase two, or maybe you can stop, say, for these individuals who started in phase two, you could stop after phase three. So you can make some modifications to try to account for and to try to minimize the burden that you impose on the clinical centers and the participants within the clinical center. But honestly, I think that's the main reason that they have become more popular is because of the fact it does help with recruiting institutions, uh, clinical centers, et cetera, to participate. Okay, another question is, um, is about the complexity step wedge cluster look very complex. So is that good to avoid it? Well, again, it's a trade-off what the researchers want to accomplish. Um, yes, it adds a level of complexity, but is it worth doing because it's gonna make it easier and smoother to recruit facilities or clinics to participate? Um, the third question is, why do you expect the intercluster correlation to be higher in the step wedge design? Actually, I don't. I'm sorry if I gave that impression. Um, it's not necessarily going to be true that the ICC will be higher in a step wedge design. It's just that the statistical advantage in terms of power is increased if the ICC is higher than lower. So if you anticipate a, um, an interclass, intercluster correlation that's going to be 0.05 or larger, yeah, there's an advantage to the step wedge design in terms of statistical power. Uh, another question is, is there a way to minimize contamination? Um, yes, I mean, ideally, it would be nice to do individual randomization, but if there's a concern about contamination, um, that's the reason to resort to a cluster randomized design. Can you minimize contamination? Well, that could be very difficult. Um, you know, you're trying to get your participants not to talk to one another. Um, especially, like I said, if, at the beginning, especially if the intervention is of an educational or behavioral nature, that could be difficult. It's easy for contamination. If you're talking about a pharmaceutical intervention, that may be easier to avoid contamination uh, simply because individuals will be taking their own prescribed medications. But even there, it's possible to have contamination. I remember stories being told about the early days of doing AIDS clinical trials, where AIDS patients would meet afterwards, at, you know, they would get together regularly and they would share their medicines, knowing that half the medicines say were placebo and half were active medicines but they thought it would be best to share their medicines. Um, and in this way, they had a good chance of getting some active medicine rather than just being randomized to placebo. So even if you have a pharmaceutical product as your intervention, it's still possible 
that there will be some level of contamination. You know, I'm sure the risk might be less, but there's still a possibility. Um, another question is, I didn't see, um, oh, wait a minute. So the next question is, supposing that the step wedge theoretically provides the same average treatment effect as a regular cluster randomized trial, is the meaningful change to design effect for the stepped wedge? Okay, Terry, you've stumped me. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't. Uh, I haven't investigated that issue. So I apologize, but I really don't know the answer to that. And then another, <laughs> thank you, Terry. Um, and then Dr. Yilma had another question. You didn't see a limitation on the contour statement. By limitation, I assume you mean limitations in terms of the study design. I didn't go through everything that appears in the consort statement. So I did give the ref, actually I did give um, Dr. Zhu the, uh, the PDF files in case anybody wants the PDF files with the consort statements. Dr. Zhu has those. Yeah, I will, I will uh, uh, make this available. Yeah, so there might be something in there about limitations, but I didn't put that in my slides. So Terry's trying again. Uh, are there sample size advantages to step wedge over the usual cluster randomized design? Well, again, there are but that's under the circumstance that you have a intracluster correlation that's say large, you know, greater than 0.05, for example. Very nice discussion, <laughs> even if uh, like a half is online. Uh, if you have more questions, please post. And feel free to email me later on if you think of something. I would try to respond by email. Looks like there might be another question. Oh, sure. Okay. I think I think somebody raised the hand. Um, let, me, let me check again. I saw I saw somebody raised hand. Probably he or she wants to talk. Would you could you raise hand again? Okay. Uh, Vern, uh, I have a, a quick question. Like, uh, uh, logistically, uh, how to handle the, uh, the cluster with, uh, with a very different uh, sizes? Like some of the clusters, maybe like uh, the hospital has lots of uh, patients, available patients, but some only has very few. So in terms of like the randomization, if you want to keep balance between two arms, then uh, technically how, how do we handle that? Well, if, if that's anticipated that some of your clusters are large, you know, in large metropolitan areas and it's gonna be easier for them to recruit participants, whereas others are in more rural areas and it might be more difficult for them to recruit. So yeah, if you anticipate- Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you anticipate there will be differences across the clusters in terms of their sample sizes, then yeah, um, basically what I would have to do in that case, I mean, I showed 
the development for the sample size calculation based on assuming equal sample sizes across the clusters. But that's just cause you get a form, a nice straightforward formula for that. If there's anticipation that that'll be different across clusters, um, what I typically do then is I simply do a uh, computer simulation study. Oh. You know, I could try to develop a formula analytically. So if I know that there's going to be 10 clusters and five of them will be have twice as many people as uh, five other clusters, then, you know, something, a simple assumption like that, I might be able to work out a closed form expression for this design effect. Mm -hmm. But typically though, what I would do rather than try to come up with a closed form expression for the design effect is simply do a computer simulation study where I would generate maybe a few thousand data sets yeah. under my assumptions and then try to estimate the statistical power uh, across those few thousand data sets. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Um, see if, if our audience has more questions. Uh, another another quick question from from me uh, if, if our audience does not have a good question uh, is that uh, I see I see you have a, like a, a quick example in the sample size calculation that you first uh, determine the um, the uh, sample size like the total sample size then you assume like each cluster has a certain number of participants then then you then you decide the number of clusters needed. Uh, in the in the real practice, is it possible that to firstly decide the number of cluster, and then uh, then work out the total sample size? Um, sure. In fact, that's what happens a lot of time. It's just easier to present the example here, doing okay. it the other way. But yes, if your number of clusters is fixed, then you can work your magic <laughs> to try to determine, you know, how many people do you need per cluster, right? Okay. Now what's discovered sometimes though, with, with that design effect, since it's one plus the cluster sample size minus one times the intra-cluster correlation, it could be that you're just not gonna reach 80% or 90% statistical power given, you know, if you're only going planning to have 12 clusters. So yeah, you can do your sample size calculation when you're fixing the number of clusters, but when you actually do the calculations, you may discover that that number of clusters is insufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'll have to recruit additional clusters. But that makes sense, thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, no more new questions. Uh, if you uh, if you have uh, any other questions uh, later on, uh, you may also send an email to uh, Dr. Chinchili about this topic. Uh, Vern, if you could uh, stop sharing, uh, let me. Okay. I I just have a. Uh, like sure. Some final statement. Share my screen. Okay. Uh, so, uh, for our audience, uh, here this is a list of all the uh, bird uh, seminars for this uh, fall semester. Um, we have just finished the uh, uh, number four. Uh, seminar. So there are, uh, there are actually four more. So uh, as I said, I do encourage you to uh, register uh, for the other uh, seminars for this fall semester and uh, hope to see you uh, in the future.
thank you very much again for, for this. Okay, nice sure. Talk. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay, I think uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I will uh, I will make the uh, uh, materials and uh, like like uh, the video recording as well as the uh, slides, and there are there are a few uh, references uh, available. Uh, so uh, most likely you will you will see the link uh, through your email. So please check your email. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.